on just one night of bad sleep, a metabolically healthy person will be essentially pre-diabetic the next day, temporarily. Well, yeah, you become more insulin resistant. Um, you know, sleep is is the elixir of life. It is the most widely available, democratic, and powerful healthcare system I could ever possibly imagine. What is going on guys? Welcome back to a new video as always. So I was watching Joe Rogan, a podcast, and it had this person on it, Matthew Walker. Very interesting podcast. The newest statistics on sleep, you know, why is it so important? For myself, you know, when I was younger, I'd stay up to four in the morning, wake up at 12 in the afternoon, you know, I'd still get the eight hours of sleep. But then I was thinking to myself, why am I still so exhausted? Why do I feel depressed, lethargic, anxiety, all this stuff, if I got the eight hours of sleep, you know? But there's a big contribution to it. It's we have to be aligned with our circadian rhythms. We have to be aligned with, you know, the waking cycles and, and our bodies are tuned to nature and the biology factor of it. And if we go against that, if we stay up in the nights and are exposed to lights and, and we're minimizing the melatonin release because we're looking at our phones and all these different kinds of things that are detrimental to our health. I started realizing that once I fixed up my sleep cycles, my anxiety, my depression, all these different kinds of physical symptoms dramatically reduced 50, 60% easily. And you know, I made a compilation, you know, I, I downloaded these videos. So I want you guys to watch this, you know, it's 10, 15 minutes of your time. But you will learn more about sleep in this 10 to 15 minutes than you have in your whole life. Like these are the newest statistics. This guy, Matthew Walker, PhD in psychology, PhD in neuroscience. Like you will learn a lot about him. You will learn a lot about sleep and why it is so important. You know, we, we, we minimize, you know, this literally this longevity master hack. And, and we think that you know, diet's going to change our lives and, and drink enough water and exercising, but we really don't emphasize sleep. Sleep's just this kind of like, eh, it's like when I go to sleep, it'll happen. It's just like, no, it's just like you need to be disciplined. You need to make the time. For myself, I finish work at 9 p.m. and sometimes I'd get home and play Fortnite till 11.30 or 12, but now it's a little different. You know, I get home, it's 10 o'clock, it's just fucking unwind. Go to bed early. You know, wake, go to bed at 10, 11 p.m. and wake up an hour earlier than you did. You know, maybe go to bed at like 11 p.m. or 12. Just go a little earlier and wake up early. Like that's that's what you should do to, to just make things easier on yourself. And it will push your 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 symptoms of illness, sickness, depression, anxiety. Like whatever you think of can be minimized if you just work on being disciplined with your sleep, but I'm going to throw in this compilation of videos into this video. Just based on the mortality and, you know, risk of Alzheimer's and cancer by itself, you just don't want to undersleep. Even in short doses, like you have a couple of days a week, like here's the, if, if sleep is not a renewable resource, like what is the effect of, say, if you have three nights a week where you sleep eight hours and then the next night, two hours. And then the next night, eight hours. How much of a bump or how much of a dip does that two hours give you in your overall health? It's bad. It's bad. So I'll give you two examples. There was a study where they just took individuals and they just gave them four hours of sleep for one night. And what they saw was a 70% reduction in critical anti-cancer fighting immune cells called natural killer cells. These are wonderful immune assassins that target malignant cells. So... Today, both you and I have produced cancer cells in our body. What prevents those cancer cells from becoming the disease that we call cancer is in part these natural killer cells. And after one night of four hours of sleep, that is a remarkable state of immune deficiency. And that's one of the reasons why insufficient sleep predicts cancer. Wow. I could also speak about your cardiovascular system, though, and all it takes is one hour because there is a global experiment that's performed on 1.6 billion people across 70 countries twice a year, and it's called daylight savings time. Mm. Now, in the spring, when we lose an hour of sleep, we see a subsequent 24% increase in heart attacks. What? 
in the fall, in the autumn, when we gain an hour of sleep, there's a 21% decrease in heart attacks. So it's bi-directional. Wow. That's how fragile and vulnerable your body is to even just the smallest perturbation of sleep. One hour. One hour is That's all insane. it takes. That's insane. Yeah. Wow. That is, you're blowing my fucking mind. <laughs> it's frightening. I mean, you can go even further, by the way. You know. Wow. Insufficient sleep will even erode the very fabric of biological life itself, your DNA code. So in one study, they took a group of healthy adults and they limited them to six hours of sleep for one week. And they compared the profile of gene activity relative to when those same people were getting eight hours of sleep. And there were two critical results. The first was that a sizable 711 genes were distorted in their activity caused by one week of six hours of sleep, which is highly relevant, by the way, because we know that many people are trying to survive on six hours of sleep during the week. Wow. The you, second, sorry. No, please go. Uh, I was going to say the second sort of perhaps more interesting result was that about half of those genes were actually increased in their activity. The other half were actually suppressed. Those genes that were switched off by six hours of sleep for one week were genes related to your immune response, many of them. So you become immune deficient. Those genes that were increased or what we call overexpressed were genes that were related to the promotion of tumors, genes that were related to long-term chronic inflammation within the body, and genes that were associated with stress and as a consequence, cardiovascular disease. This is unbelievable. What should someone do? Um, if they have a hard time sleeping, like say if you're a person who has insomnia, you have a hard time getting getting to bed, you have, you have a hard time staying asleep. When you wake up, you can't go back to bed. Yeah, are there are there strategies? There are. I mean, I think for most people, there are five things that you can do just out the gate to get better sleep. Regularity is probably the most important thing I can tell you. Go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, no matter whether it's the weekend, weekday. Regularity is key. We've spoken about light. For example, when you, in the last hour before bed, try to stay away from screens, but also just switch off half the lights in the house. Mm. You'd be surprised at how soporific that is. It really starts to sort of make you feel a bit more drowsy. They've done some great studies where they would take people out, you know, into the Rockies, no electric light, no electricity whatsoever. And they started to go to bed two hours earlier than their acclaimed natural bedtime. Mm. It wasn't just because they didn't have anything necessarily to do. It was that their melatonin was rising, you know, two hours earlier. So keep it dark. The third is probably keep it cool. Your brain actually needs to drop its temperature by about two to three degrees Fahrenheit to initiate sleep. Mm. And that's the reason that you will always find it easier to fall asleep in a room that's too cold than too hot. I've seen people use cold pads. Yeah. Have you seen those? Are you sleep on these cold pads? What do you yeah. think of those? Yeah. I mean, the, the evidence is pretty good that cooling the body actually works. They've, um, you know, in the book, I write about uh, a, a series of studies where they had people in, it's almost like a wetsuit, but it has all of these veins running through it. And they could actually perfuse warm or cold water into any part of the body, hands, core of the body, feet. And so that you could exquisitely manipulate the temperature of any part of the body. And what they found is that they could effectively cool the body down and it instantaneously made people fall asleep faster and it gave them deeper, deep non-REM sleep, that sort of restorative sleep for the body. Huh. So, and you can even look at studies where people sleep semi-naked and that also seems to improve their sleep and they get a little bit more deep sleep too. So cold is better. The paradox here though, is that you need to warm your feet and your hands to kind of charm the blood away from your core out to the surface and radiate that heat. Really? So, so yeah. you should go to sleep with socks and gloves on? Yeah, or better still have a hot bath. Um, evidence here too um, that I discuss where people say, you know, I get out of a hot bath, I feel nice and toasty and relaxed and that's why I fall asleep. It's the opposite. When you get into a bath, you get vasodilation. All you sort of get rosy cheeks, red skin. All of the blood rushes to the surface. You get out of the bath, and you have this massive thermal dump of heat that just evacuates from the body. Your core body temperature plummets, and that's why you sleep better. So you can hack the system very easily. Wow, 
So your core body temperature plummets, and that's what makes you sleep easier. Yeah. That sounds so counterintuitive. Yeah. But it makes sense. And it makes sense because that's how we were designed. If you look at hunter-gatherer tribes whose way of life has not changed for thousands of years, and you ask, how do they sleep? One of the things that seems to dictate their sleep is the rise and fall of temperature. You know, temperature is at its lowest in the nadir of the night, you know, three or four in the morning. And as that temperature, that climate temperature starts to drop, that's when they start to get drowsy, as if temperature is just sort of signaling to the brain, now it's time to sleep. So light as well as temperature are two key triggers to help you get better sleep. Um, if you look at those tribes, by the way, and when they go to sleep and they wake up, um, you know, they go to sleep probably at two hours after dusk, sort of eight to nine in the evening, wake up about half an hour, even an hour before dawn. It's the rise in temperature rather than light that triggers their awakening. Wow. Um, but there's a reason, you know, have you ever thought about what the term midnight actually means? <laughs> Middle of the night. Right. And that's what it should be for all of us. But in modernity, we've been dislocated from our natural rhythms. And now midnight has become the time when we think, I should check Facebook last time. You know, I should you know, send my last email. <laughs> yeah. that, that wasn't, that is not how we were, you know, designed to sleep. And in fact, we may also be designed to sleep biphasically too. If you look at those hunter gatherers, they don't sleep one long bout of eight hours at night. Yeah, I've heard this recently that people, that you should have two sleeps. The idea of two sleeps. Yeah, it's actually a little different than the idea of two sleeps. So there was a time in sort of the Dickensian era where people would sleep for the first half of the night, maybe sort of four hours or so. Then they would wake up, they would socialize, they would eat, they would make really? love, and then they would go back and have a second sleep. If you look at natural biological rhythms in the brain and the body, that doesn't really seem to be how we were designed. It certainly seems to be something that we did in society, but I think it's more of a societal um, trend than it was a biological edict. However, we do seem to have two sleep periods the way that we were designed. Those tribes will often sleep about six and a half hours, seven hours of sleep at night. And then especially in the summer, they'll have that siesta-like behavior in the afternoon. And all of us have that, sort of this, what's called the postprandial dip in alertness, just means after lunch. And if I measure your brainwave activity with electrodes, I can see a drop in your physiological alertness somewhere between 2 to 4 p.m. in the afternoon. But is that dependent on diet? It's not. People think it is, you know, especially after they've had a heavy lunch. Yeah. You can actually just have people fast and sort of, uh, well, fasting for long periods of time actually makes your sleep much worse. But... Um, you can have people abstain from lunch and you still get that drop. So it's independent of food. It's a genetically hardwired pre-programmed drop that suggests we should be sleeping biphasically. But does, is that dependent upon their standard diet? Because if, if someone is on a, a carbohydrate-rich carbohydrate diet, a lot of times you do get that spike and yeah. then you crash. crash. That's, but when people are on low-carb and high-fat diets, they don't get that. And they, they, they tend to be more even with their energy through the day. Yeah. So yeah, that sort of more constant release of energy can actually help you sort of almost combat that lull. But, but that, that lull exists that, no matter what. Exactly. So even if you don't think it exists, it's there. It's still present. Interesting. Yeah. So why did they do that in the, the, the Dickens era? Why did they, what, what, is there a root cause of their double sleep thing? We don't know. I mean, it's hard to sort of really go back. Fascinating. There's, yeah, it's incredible. That, that was a know, trend. Yeah, that it was a movement. That they would just wake up and do things and. Yeah. Maybe it's because they didn't have TV. <laughs> and they yeah. didn't know what to do with themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, sounds like they did some pretty interesting yes. things, which were nice. But yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, prescribing sleeping pills. That's a separate story. Sleeping pills are associated with significantly higher risk of death and cancer. And, and I'm happy to speak about that, too. It was the one chapter in the book that I think the um, the legal team of my publisher took, took a very long, long look at. But I think doctors, to come back to your point, they on average only have about two hours of sleep education in the medical curriculum. So one third two of- Two hours. Two hours. One third of their- This podcast has been two hours. Yeah. yeah that's, that's fucking crazy. So isn't that frightening? That's terrifying. And I bet you probably have laid things out better in this podcast than you would get in those two hours of education. 
I, I I don't know about that, but I think I'll, if, I'll give you that credit. If they could, <laughs> if they could increase that, you know, I'm that's and insane. I'm desperately appealing for this. You know, it's a third of their patient's life, but they only get two hours of education. And, but the other problem is the medical industry itself. By the way, you know, their residents, that data, you know, junior residents working a thirty-hour shift are 460% more likely to make diagnostic errors in the intensive care unit relative to when they're working 16 hours. If you have elective surgery, you should ask your surgeon how much sleep they've had in the past 24 hours. If they've had six hours of sleep or less, you have a 170% increased risk of a major surgical error, such as sort of organ damage or hemorrhaging relative to that same surgeon if they had been well rested and then the irony here, by the way, is that when a resident finishes a 30-hour shift, gets back into their car to drive home, there is a 168% increased risk that they will get into a car accident because of their underslept state, being ending up back in the same emergency room where they just came from, but now as a patient Jesus from a car Christ. crash. You know, it's we need to radically rethink the importance of sleep in education, in in business, in the workplace, and in medicine too. Why? Well, why do we accept treatment? You know, after 20 hours of being awake, you're as impaired as you would be if you were legally drunk. So unfortunately, we placed young residents in this position yes. of, you know, acting and operating and decision making under conditions of insufficient sleep. One in five medical residents will make a serious medical error due to insufficient sleep. One in 20 medical residents will kill a patient because of a fatigue related error. <sighs> One in 20. That's yeah. crazy. And right now, you know, there are well over 20,000 medical residents. So if you have practice. 100 of them, five are going to kill people. Accidental deaths. That's Think insane. about that number. That's insane. If we were to solve the sleep loss epidemic in medicine, you know, we could start saving lives. And I don't know what it is. Is it just a, you know, an old boys network where we said, well, we went through it. Yes. So you've got to go through it. You know, and the, the data now is so prolific. You know, I write all about that and try to make a build a, an evidence based, you know, emotionless cold case for sleep in medicine, a sleep prescription for medicine, as it were. Well, most people don't realize the requirements that residents have. No. And, and they are they are literally, you know, beyond human capacity, thinking that, you know, hubris and some degree of hours on the job is going to be able to allow you to sort of, you know, cut short what took three and a half million years to sort of, you know, get in place, which is an eight hour night of sleep. That's just thick headed. You know, it's and I think the medical profession may be at the stage where it's my mind is made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. Wow. That that this is blowing me away. I just don't understand how the very people that are working on the health of patients and fixing them and repairing injuries and taking care of diseases, those are the people that are ignoring one of the primary factors of disease and errors yeah. and cognitive function. It's, it's impairment. It's a travesty. I um, have a friend who's an ophthalmologist and he tells a story about during his residency, he was, uh, it was back in the 80s and he had a pager. He was on the toilet with a tray of food on his lap because he didn't have time to eat and go to the bathroom. So he's eating food and he fell asleep. Yeah. And then his pager went off and he's like, fuck my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, mean, how many warnings, how many warning bells do you need to yes. tell you that you're in a deleterious state if you're falling asleep with your trousers around your ankles yes. with food all over your face <laughs> and yet you're in the deepest stages of non-REM sleep. And he's a guy who's working on people's eyes. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, and it's, you know, sleep is equally absent for the patient in the hospital, you know, setting. We know that somewhere between 50 to 70% of all um, ICU alarms are either unnecessary or ignorable. You know, and the one place where you desperately need the Swiss army knife of health that is a good night of sleep mm. is the one place where you get at least, which is on a hospital ward. We could, we could exit people out of hospital beds earlier. The data is already there for the neonatal intensive care unit. They used to leave bright lights on 24 seven. Right. And that would prevent sort of the signaling for sleep and wake and sleep and wake. And that right. cycle is critical. If you regularize sleep, 
uh, sorry, if you regularized light in the neonatal intensive care unit, those infants ended up having higher levels of oxygen saturation because they were sleeping better. Their weight gain was dramatically increased, and they ended up exiting the neonatal intensive care unit five weeks earlier. Whoa. Simple things. You know, why don't we do something like this in medicine? When you come in onto a hospital ward, you get this on an international flight travel for free, earplugs, face mask. Even yeah. just that by itself could help people to start get better sleep. Next, on the hospital admission form, tell me when you normally go to sleep and when you normally wake up. And to the best of our ability, we as doctors will try to tr sort of, you know, manage your healthcare around your natural sleep tendencies. If we could do that, you know, sleep is, is the elixir of life. It is the most widely available, democratic and powerful healthcare system I could ever possibly imagine. Why aren't we leveraging that and taking it? That's one of the greatest hacks that medicine could actually, you know, inflect. That is now, once people start to understand the science, as we've spoken about for two hours, then people start to actually realize it's not the third pillar of good health alongside diet and exercise. It's the foundation on which those two other things sit. You know, for example, if you're dieting, but you're not getting sufficient sleep, 70% of all the weight that you lose will come from lean body mass, muscle, and not fat. Your body becomes stingy in giving up its fat when it's underslept. So once you get this information out there, things are starting to change. I've started to have um, some discussions with the World Health Organization. They seem to be very interested now in, in getting, getting to grips with sleep. I'd, I'd love to speak to first world governments though. When was the last time you saw any first world nation have a government supported public health campaign around sleep? I don't know any. We've had them for, you know, drink driving, for risky behaviors, you know, for drugs, for alcohol, for healthy eating. Sleep should be a part of that equation. You know, I want to lobby governments to start to instigate this and it will save them millions of dollars. The Rand Corporation, did an independent survey two years ago on the demonstrable cost of a lack of sleep to global economies. What they found was that a lack of sleep costs most nations about 2% of their GDP, their gross domestic product. Here in America, that number was $411 billion caused by insufficient sleep. Solve the sleep loss epidemic, you could almost double the budget for education and you could almost halve the deficit for healthcare. <sighs> wow.